good. Well, they really are. Good. It's even better. Um, so today we're going to talk about the back. Uh, most of it's sacred life joint, which is there that has uh, gotten, gotten new attention over the past couple of years. Um, in the past, we just kind of ignored it because there wasn't much to do for it. Uh, and I hope you all can hear me. I talk kind of well sometimes. Also, I trained in New York, so I talk fast. So I'm going too fast. <laughs> so we're going to go over the introduction, anatomy, spine. Uh, some of the uh, common causes of low back pain. How do you diagnose the sacred leg joint, which is the main focus of this uh, talk? Uh, what are some of the treatment options? And then obviously, the news is going to be a brief talk, and I go quick. Uh, there's plenty of time for some questions afterward. So, approximately 85% of all people uh, develop back pain at some point in their life. So, that's almost everybody in this room. Maybe when you're young, maybe when you're old, or somewhere in between. It's 15 million office visits a year. Uh, it's the fifth most common reason people go to the doctor in the U.S. and it's about eighty-six billion dollars. Eighty-six billion dollars a year uh, spent on spine care, which is quite a lot. Uh, what can you cause all that? Obviously, all that uh, the hip or the sacroiliac joint, all three things that surround the spine. Area. <coughs> What's the most common misdiagnosis? Well, hip arthritis. So if you have a bad hip. Uh, it can mimic a lot of the same symptoms that a, uh, a bad back can feel. Uh, we probably see a patient every month or two who's been told that they need a, a spine operation. We examine the hip a little bit, we get extra the hip, the hip looks, um, looks bad. And that can be from our price to maybe in. And obviously you get a um, hip replacement, and we're pretty well known around this area for the anterior approach. Uh, something that everybody in this practice pretty much does, uh, who does hip replacements. Uh, give you a quick rehab. Everybody asks, well, why do I put this hip talk in here? I put it in because I want you to know, if somebody tells you you need back surgery, make sure it's not your hip first. Uh, what's the anatomy of the spine? Well, you've got 24 vertebrae that attaches your skull down to your uh, pelvis. Uh, they're sort of building blocks on your the back. They're what's helping keep you up straight along with the uh, muscles uh, that connect the top and the bottom. There's cushions in between, which are the vertebral discs. Uh, what does it do? Well, it protects your spine. It also creates a neighbor arm so that you can walk upright. Uh, it also allows the uh, nerves to exit out from the side of it. Uh, and the last thing that connects the sacrum, which is the bottom, which is the bottom part of the spine, which is actually about five vertebrae fused together, and the pelvis. That's the area that we're going to concentrate on tonight. So, what's the anatomy of sacroiliac joint? Well, it's very heavily stabilized by ligaments. So, everybody asks me, you know, you're going to fuse this level and then only lose all this motion. Well, the actual motion of the SI joint for uh, men is about two millimeters, and for women, is about two to four millimeters. There's really not much motion at all. So if you fuse it or it becomes arthritic, you're not going to really notice a significant change in your range of motion. Unlike, say, a hip fusion or a spinal fusion, where you may notice more of that loss of bending and flexing. Uh, you can have, frankly, an arthritic joint where it's just wear and tear like any other joint. Uh, you can have too much motion, which causes a stretch on the ligaments, which causes inflammation, which can cause pain. So it could be either that it's too stiff or it's too loose. Either one would cause pain in that sacral leg joint. What about the nerves? Well, we'll know this the old line is possible. It looks like the uh, bell telephone from like 50 years ago. Um, all these nerves cross over, interdigitate, they interdict multiple areas. And this is why it makes it so hard for the body to figure out where that pain you can have a hip problem that looks like a back problem, that looks like an SI joint problem. Uh, and the reason is, all those signals go from your joint to your lower extremities, getting your spinal cord, kind of cross over each other. Then they have to go to your brain to try and decipher where that pain is coming from. And the brain sometimes can fool, it's fooled and can't figure it out. Just like you hear when people have a heart attack, they say they have pain going up the neck, down the arm. They don't always feel the chest pain when you have a heart attack. And that's that same reason. They're all cross innervated by, by nerves from each other. So what are some of the reasons for SI joint disruptions? Well, you can have degenerative disc disease, you can have history of trauma, you can have pregnancy and uh, childbirth, uh, and lumbar fusion. I always ask patients in the room, if I give you three of the most common orthopedic procedures, uh, hip replacement, knee replacement, and spinal fusion, which one do you think would be the most common operation done in the US? Yeah. Man, that be right. So the numbers are really about 150 
thousand hips and done a year, about three hundred fifty thousand knees, and about six hundred fifty thousand spine I get that reaction all the time. People think that the spine fusions are an uncommon procedure. It's a fairly significant number. Go back to the first slide. That eighty-five percent of Americans suffer from back pain at some point in life. Eighty-six billion dollars a year in spinal cord costs per year. That's where all this money is going. To. If you think that spinal fusion is going to cure everybody, there's so many different stories of spinal fusions that don't work. It may fix that area that, that it's designed to work on. It may cause problems in other areas, including the sacred joint levels involved or other So it's a significant problem for a lot of people. So how does the uh, SI joint present? Well, number one, you've got to have pain in your SI joint. So if you're skinny enough, you can feel in your back. Yeah. There's a little step up, one on each side. That's your sacred leg joint. If you don't have pain there, it's most likely not your sacred leg joint. The other way is to present, you gotta have that pain right there in the SI joint, but you can also have pain radiating down the legs. It can cause spasm up the back. It can cause difficult ambulating or walking around. Uh, all those type of things can be caused by the SI joint. How do you diagnose the SI joint? Well, it's one of those things a lot more focused than put on. So number one, you want a physician who operates in that side joint or diagnoses it uh, on a fairly regular basis so they know what maneuvers to put you in and try to figure it out. Um, it's not usually a cardiac low back workup. So if you have a guy who just does spinal fusions and doesn't really look at the SI joint, you may get a spinal fusion as opposed to an SI joint uh, uh, correction. Um, in the past, physicians that were trained to look for it, there wasn't much to do for it. You know, it was a pain. Pain management, and that'd be the last thing we see you in the office. Um, you can mimic other problems such as the hip and the disc, uh, and that potentially leading, uh, you know, misunderstanding of where the pain is coming from can get you the wrong diagnosis and the wrong treatment. Everyone thinks we can do a magic MRI or a CT scan and that's going to diagnose it. So, uh, and CT scans and MRIs, I think 42% are negative for symptomatic SI joints. So I use the MRI and the CT scan. To Test like that to make sure it's not something else. Uh, we want to make sure that we're not missing a herniation or an infection or some other thing that can cause any problem as opposed to just a clinical diagnosis of us putting our hands on you to try and figure out where this pain is coming from. So, what do you have? What are the criteria for diagnosis? Well, you got to have uh, pain over the SI joint. Uh, there's a provocative test where we bend you like a pretzel, and we got to get like three of those positive. The final one is injecting the SI joint. Uh, if we inject the SI joint with condotine, if you get it to the dentist, it shouldn't numb that joint up, and you should get greater than 80 to 90% relief for a few hours. Once the numbing medicine wears off, well then the pain should come back. And we usually like to do at least one, and if that fails, try a second one so you can get a good response from it. There's a very smart guy, Dr. Corton. First one that uh, sort of described this, and he got the name of the test that I was named after. Uh, basically, it hurts here. It's the SI joint. That's the uh, key to one. Um, it can affect either side. Uh, we check to make sure that both SI joints look symmetrical. Yeah. Sometimes people have trauma, you have a dislocation or some sort of uh, abnormality uh, where they, they're not the same. So here are the pretzel tests. <coughs> Stress in the SI joint, trying to provocatively cause your pain, to make sure that the SI joint is in the area that's the problem. And we'll talk about a lot of fun in the <coughs> Final one of the SI joint injections. Uh, we do diagnostic injections for confirming the diagnosis. That's just no pain. It should give you good relief uh, after about 20 30 minutes. After we no pain, has some time to work. Um, sometimes we can do a second injection just to make sure that we're. Doing the right thing. Uh, but if you don't get a good response, it's either because it's not your SI joint or it wasn't put in the right spot. Uh, and sometimes that happens. The joint is very small, and that's why we like to try it at least twice if you get a failure the first time. So, what do we do for this? Obviously, we don't rush you off the door as the first thing. Uh, we like to try anti-inflammatories, narcotics, uh, you can do some alternative things like chiropractic manipulation, uh, deep tissue massage, acupuncture. Uh, 
there's physical therapy you can do, there's a pelvic stabilization belt, um, there's also some arc ablation, that's where they put a little needle in there, turn on an electric machine, and it kind of burns up the sensory nerves. So here's an SI joint belt, and all that does is kind of wrap around the pelvis at the top, try to give it some stability, it takes some of the pressure off that area. What's the whole role there? Well, Increases joint mobility around the SI joint. Try and decrease the motion there, decrease the stress, and give you some support and make you feel better. In a power scheme, you get this, the straps that you're allowed to do, but is, this, is that almost the same thing? Oh, okay. This is a little more rigid, and you okay. can tighten it down a little better, or it doesn't um, stretch out. So it's going to give you a little more support than the one you can get in the, uh, at the power scheme. Most insurances will cover this because you're not going to pay for it. Treatment obviously is physical therapy. Uh, the goal of physical therapy is to increase your core muscles, allow your, your muscles and your body to support your body better. Number one and number two, also stretch everything out except the SI joint so that as you move off, there's less pressure and less pull being uh, tugged on that SI joint and your low back. We get in, in, in injections, so we usually uh, try cortisone injections before we do any type of surgery. Hopefully it'll give you months early. You can get them repeated every three months or so. Uh, there's also radio frequency ablation, which looks a lot like an injection, except instead of medicine going in there, they connect with a little electric cord and you don't, you don't feel any shots, but it burns up the nerves a little bit. The problem with that, um, the radio frequency ablation is the nerves regenerate every six months. So it's a process that needs to be repeated uh, every swap. And the last thing Surgery. Uh, they usually put it on the devices. They're uh, usually two or three metal uh, uh, implants. Same material as put on for a uh, total hip and total knee for the bony knee growth. So the material has been around for a while. It's a very short procedure. Most people go home that day or the next day. It's about four to six weeks to, to what we call recovery period. Um, and what the idea behind this is to stabilize the joint so there's less motion and less stress going through there. And that should take the weight of pain. Triangular shape that gives you more surface area to grow in and also more stability uh, so that the uh, implant doesn't move, uh, which gives it a, a better chance of growing into the uh, a better uh, uh, outcome. So, obviously, you don't want to use them for infections and other uh, tumors, that kind of stuff, uh, and there is risk for any of surgery. So, if you have a little back pain, you should first get a correct diagnosis and get the treatment directed at that diagnosis. If all else fails, uh, there are some surgical options for the SI joint and the uh, other back, back columns that are not related to the SI joint. That's it. Don't you quick. You can talk. That's it. There's plenty of time for questions. That's the I hope you guys have some questions. I'll start here. Well, Some people have it debilitating 24 24 7 no, 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 no. But it sounds like the hands on approach is the, the best diagnostic tool. Right. The movement of the body. Yeah, this is hard to diagnose on any kind of yeah. scan. Like a herniated disc and spinal stenosis. Mm -hmm. You kind of need that x ray the MRI CT so scan to look at the, the uh, stenosis, look at the anatomy. Mm -hmm. This is more a diagnosis of exclusion and hands on. So I've had the fusion of the lower lumbar, but then I've had the burning of the nerve there in, in the area. Can you, you see that wears off in maybe six months? To, so can that be done, repeated, that procedure, that ablation? Sure, okay. Everything, everything but the surgery can be repeated on a regular basis. Some are three months with the injections, our ablations usually six months or so. Uh, the physical therapy, you know, That goes for, for other sources of pain, not just the SI joint. So you have the set joint problems higher up in the spine. They can be injected, they can have the arm inflation, the therapy, the medicines, all that stuff. 
surgery trail should be sort of towards the end for just pure pain. The only time you do surgery on the spine in a uh, sort of more rapid fashion is if you have neurologic compromise, so you've got herniation uh, or bad stenosis that's causing muscle weakness, atrophy, uh, incontinence, those type of things. Then you want to get them taken care of pretty quickly. Does sacroiliac cause numbness in the feet? Typically not, but it could present in, in any uh, same symptoms that you get with a radiculopathy or breach nerve. Most people notice more of a set of numbness in the feet more versus a radicular shooting pain up down the leg. It could be in the groin, it could be on the side, it could be on the back, it could be in the And it's not going to take a man back. Um, Sounds more like it's back. We see that a lot. Um, people have hip arthritis, you know, the hip is stiff, and so it's constantly pulling on the back. So it aggravates the arthritis of the back, it aggravates the SI joint. Once you free up the hip and the hip pain kind of subsides, then you start to notice some other things that are still a problem and that haven't been addressed, but you're seeing the question. I had some injections. Sometimes you know, there are patients who come in and we just say, look, there's a surgery that uh, will help you. You know, we'll try alternative things like you know, the injection pain management, spinal stimulators, things like that, which are fairly successful. Patients have a radical pain who aren't fixed or fixable by surgery. Well, that is Less joint dislocation requires a lot of trauma. You know, you have to rip through all those ligaments to, to make that joint separate. And that's usually associated with motor vehicle collision or, or a fall from a, a great height. We get a lot of patients who, you know, the, the physical therapist, the chiropractor said that they're subluxating or dislocating their SI joint and they're pushing it back in place and relocating it. If that's, you know, that's that sensation of that mild instability. It's probably moving a couple millimeters in there. It's not a true dislocation. It's not Supplementation, but you know, that manipulation sort of changes the position of the SI joint enough that people feel that feel like it's popping back in place, um, and that's that like the stability, that feeling of it just not feeling right, uh, and a lot of that's just you know some of it's from post fusion or arthritis, and some of it's just from people having lax ligaments, you know, genetically. Sometimes the pressure point or muscle spasm, if you press on it, the muscle comes out of spasm and then you can start to ambulate. So it's one of those two things. And it's not all the time, it's just, you know. Just... And most, most people have back pain, you know, it's an intermittent type of thing. You can irritate the nerve or you can irritate the muscle and it spasms on you, you feel that gripping. So that would be related to the kind of the disc or anything like that? It could be, but most times it's, it's, it's wear and tear, arthritis in the spine. 
could be a disk. So people write out surgery from them two groups. Uh, one group feels really good, and just one run out of the hospital. The other group actually feels worse early on, and it, it really depends on how much swelling you have, I think. So people who feel worse have a lot more swelling in their body region, and you notice in two weeks post-op will have a lot of bruising and necrosis. Because it's percutaneous, you know, we're not making big incisions and, and you know, cauterizing how you believe it at this age. Some people's bone also bleeds more than So people who bleed more, get more swelling, have more discomfort, it's putting more pressure on the, the gluteus and the leg muscles. So they usually feel that for about two to four weeks. Okay. People get less swelling usually feel as good as those people have. Do you get bed rest and then? Ice, little mobilization, and okay. uh, you know, control activity. Usually around six weeks people are feeling, they get the right diagnosis and this helps, are feeling pretty good around six weeks with off the walk. So that tip, that little triangular piece at the base of the spine. That triangular piece at the base of the spine is your coccyx. Oh, okay, but well, I'm talking about above the coccyx. So there we go. So coccyx is the tailbone. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which ends about there. But that, see about where it says injection, that's your sacrum. Okay. And that's, see where it says injection, where the needle is going in? Mm -hmm. That's the sacrum right joint. Okay. Connects your pelvis to the sacrum, which connects your, your spine. Yes. So if you're a high stress area, the whole top of your body is being connected to the bottom of right through the two of those, one on each side. And that's it, that's the only thing that connects the top of the body. Yeah, it just feels like that indentation that you're talking about right there on either side of the spine is further out than where I feel the pain at the little triangular area of the sacrum. So your pain may not be coming from the SF joint. Arthritis in that the main spine area. And that's why you know, not only use the MRI, but the, the palpation, the physical exam, the hand on stuff is more, more important. I said the, the physical exam is more important yes. to put the SI joint to make sure that's where you're really, you know, where the pain's really coming from. Even examine the hips. You know, you know, I get a lot of patients come in, you know, they think it's the back. Typical woman's snake oil x rays don't capture the hips very well. They can capture a little bit of it. And they get a little indication that's marked by the set. That's the most like I said, common misdiagnosis or people in the office. They'll come in thinking it's the back, down the leg, and it turns out to be that they're hip and they need to do a replacement. Yes, ma'am. First of all, you said something about being confident. Your back your mm -hmm. Yeah, if you have uh, enough pressure on your nerves, you can get your joint on. What's that? I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I would say that gentleman over there that had hip replacement. Mm -hmm. Dr. Aldrey did one on me about three years ago. And I was going to have pain right where you're talking about, right here. 
and you had to go back in and loosen some ligament or something like that, and that took the pain away. Right. So maybe you need something like that. I don't remember the technical terms and all that. So um, that's one advantage of my practice. I can get to the spine, so I, I kind of do a lot of things and see a lot of pathology. Um, so in the old days, when we did a hip replacement to the back, the way we angled the cuff, we angled it down this way more so that people wouldn't pop out the back. And that was, um, it was good for to prevent dissipation. And people tend to not have much of the, the groin pain um, because of that. So, uh, but the problem was people dissipated and it took a lot longer to heal. We switched the anterior approach. The cup is not tilted down as much as more anatomically. And sometimes it gets, um, it overhangs a little bit on the front, and the iliosis tendon drops down that area a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's much more common in the anterior approach than that problem in development. Dissipation is very strong, rehab is much faster, but we've seen a lot more of this iliosis tendon irritation, mm -hmm. and people we inject it to confirm it, and sometimes we have to go Why not? Trying to grow my hair a little bit longer. He looks like he's like 20, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> but the army says I gotta cut it every month, so. Yes, ma'am. But would it be the time confusion you were performing the first time you had a bulging disc sitting on the side of the room? Yeah. Yeah. That would need a, a discectomy or, or surgery on the disc to, to decompress the disc. To So that's more of an operation on the main, I call it the main spine, so that's where the intervertebral discs are and the bones are connected. Mm -hmm. This is more of a sort of a mm -hmm. on the side joint. Is the um, kind of like the same or is it more? Uh, for that, it's probably a little less if it's just a discectomy or a laminectomy. Uh, if you're talking about spinal fusion, then, then the recovery is much longer. So I know it all, every term sort of sounds the same, spinal fusion, sacred leg joint. This, herniated this, uh, but they really all affect sort of a different area. And even a lot of doctors who don't work on the spine confuse them. Yes, sir. You indicated before that a, a true dislocation can result in a very serious trauma. Uh, if you have a minor dislocation, a couple of millimeters, where you feel it, and it can be put back into physical therapy, what's the term to describe that? And we call it more of a subluxation or uh, micro instability. Because you can feel it, it's very, uh, other than you, it's very measurable. You're talking two millimeters, it's very hard to measure that uh, on an x ray or a, a diagnostic study. And that's the more common, it's much more common for people have micro instability or over stress. So the reason fusions cause the problem is you know, you take bones that are supposed to move independently. You know, you stick them all together. It smells like a big lever arm pulling on those outside joints. You saw the magic word of chiropractic, I bet you. If you're a, a patient that's been diagnosed and you don't have SI and you don't have this, but you still have issues, you're going through physical therapy, uh, some of which is manipulative physical therapy, chiropractic therapy. My question is, um, knowing that you may have some rotation of hips, is there anything other than I've been told don't let somebody manipulate your neck, anything that shouldn't be done that could cause more harm than good? Um, anything that involves like a lot of rapid snapping, those, yes. those can be potentially, potentially paralytic or problematic. Mm -hmm. So the reason you want it on your neck is if you have some level of instability that the Thank you. 
operations and you know, we're there to fix something and we may fix that at part another week or another property in the middle of the afternoon. Can this joint just be affected on one side of your body as opposed to both sides? Or? Something, bam, something snapped, and I can feel it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and s s soon after, total agony focused on the inside of um, this thigh area. Okay, and I was in. And then it's, it slowly eases, and I'm taking it in, and I've done physical therapy. It, except as soon as, uh, as I'm, I'm taking uh, uh, some kind of, <clears throat> of a pharmaceutical uh, or the egg, as soon as it starts fading off, here it comes, it starts to make his. Can some kind of a, a surgical thing fix it, or did some the thing that slipped down so far it's gone? Yeah, I mean, if you have an MRI? No, but the sorry insurance said, no, I'm not Let's go back to treatment. So, even if you have a disc herniation, well, unless you have a major neurological <coughs> compromise, which means your legs dragging and your incontinent. Yeah, well, um, the insurance agent companies, the private insurance, all require you to do conservative care mm -hmm. at minimum six weeks. Um, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield is at least four weeks. So, and the upside is it helps a lot of people. It doesn't help everyone, but so I don't. I don't think it's a bad thing to go to therapy to conserve care. Otherwise, we'd be operating on everybody, 85% of the population. <laughs> if you look at the success rate of conserve care, it's about 80%. So by 80% of the time, someone herself will go to therapy, take some medication, and the pain will go away. Well, 20% it doesn't, and we have to more stuff to you, like injections and surgery. So it's good that you're trying to be not on the things, but if you're not getting better, you shouldn't be forced to do full six weeks, which is which is what some of these uh, children are making you do. Know. Okay. But that's it's good and it's good that they're making people do conservative care because it will save a lot of time in operation. Uh, but it's bad because it takes that decision making out of the doctor's hands. Mm -hmm. It's a purely it's something checklist for uh, the tech person on the phone. Okay, uh, I think I'm concerned over. Uh, it's a the <laughs> farmers to tell them also and other stuff. Can I soon stop expecting constant pain right in here if I stop a doggy oh, from that duck coat? Oh, oh, I forgot what it's called. Uh, you know, if you take 
way the medicines that they may get worse. It hurts. It starts to turn back. So you may be one of 20% that's going to fail to serve care if we're going to do the MRI and more stop there. Okay. I'll come in and see Dr. Hill. Try to be first on that. 